Good morning and welcome to That One Thing. I'm Julie Garnier. I'm a singer, an actress, and producer, and now your host for this show. Uh, that One Thing is exploring the one thing in my guest's life that is just the thing that fuels their fire. It's the thing that excites them the most of anything else in their life. And um, I'm really, really excited because today we have a very special guest, one of my dear friends who I just adore, um, composer, lyricist, all around amazing human being, John Bacchino. Um, he is here today to talk about his one thing as well as um, a wonderful show of his that he's got coming up. And I can't wait to talk about it because it's, it's a very exciting anniversary that we're going to celebrate. Um, before we do that, just really quickly, want to remind everybody that the um, show today, we're taking donations and a portion of the donations are going to be going to the Actors Fund. Um, the Actors Fund is for everyone in entertainment. It's not just for actors. Uh, so don't let the name fool you. Um, basically, everyone from the people on stage to the people backstage, to your ushers, your box office people, anyone involved in entertainment of any kind, including films, um, music, anything that has to do with entertainment, um, they are the ones that are going to benefit from any donations that are given today for um, the Actors Fund. Uh, so that is what we're doing. The way to donate today is um, to support us either via Venmo, which is at Julie Garnier, or you can send it to PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Julie Garnier. And I will make sure that a very large portion of what you are donating goes toward the Actors Fund. The other portion will go toward helping with um, creating this, uh, this show and keeping this uh, platform alive. This platform uh, does cost money. So um, in order for me to keep bringing you this amazing content, um, I just need a little bit of help financially and that would be so great. So thank you very much. All right. I am going to bring on my first guest. He has written Broadway shows. He's written um, amazing um, musical reviews. And of course, uh, his beautiful specialty material that everyone just clamors to sing. Um, so please welcome my special guest and my wonderful friend, John Bacchino. Hello, my dear. Hello. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking. Oh yeah, and what a great I, your 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 opening credits for the show are terrific. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I did that myself. I yeah. you did. They're great. Thanks. I just wanted to kind of show a little aspect. No one's ever asked me about that before, so thanks. I wanted to show a little aspect of of every part of life, not just the fact. I mean, we're both in the entertainment business, but um, there are other people in the world. There are there are chefs and there are astronauts and there are neurophysicists and and you know i i, I want to talk to everyone so i wanted the opening credits to kind of encapsulate how i want to speak with everyone about everything so That's what you did yeah thank you thank you so much um i'm really excited to have you here because we have we have a lot to talk about we have a lot to talk about we never we never have much to talk about <laughs> Whenever you and I get on the phone, we're on the phone for like oh, three it's like, hours. Yes. It's, yeah. always like, it's gonna be a quick one. I just have a quick question for you, and then we end up on the phone for three hours. Yeah. So we yeah. go. So now we have a lot of time here to like really just talk, and I'm super excited about that. Um, I want to start with your that one thing. So what is that one thing that like? When you wake up in the morning, aside from your family, of course, who you love, what is that one thing that you're like, oh, I just, I, you know, I can't wait to do this, or I can't wait to, to, to experience this, or what is that one thing in your life that you're the most passionate about? Well, the obvious choice, I, I had to think about this. The obvious choice would have been, of course, music. But I, I feel like my one thing is actually broader than that. Uh, and the general term that I came up with is communication. Oh. I real, right? Because I realize that I, yes, yeah, certainly communicate through my work. Uh, that's a big part of it, in fact. But I also love, as you know, by our three-hour phone, <laughs> guys, 
Um, communicating and sharing with friends, with strangers, with, you know, everybody, um, just the act of sharing how I feel about things and learning how somebody else feels about things. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps in a quest to connect with a kind of universality uh, and or a commonality in, in, in all of us, maybe that's what's at the root of it. But um, but I, I love that. And music is certainly one facet of it. I, I was just going to say that. I mean, music is definitely a facet of that. And the way that you communicate through music is... Both, in fact, more. both sharing my music and listening, you know, to my, my friends who are writers or performers such as yourself, listening to their communication through their, or, or you know, dancers or actors or whatever. But... Um, especially other writers. Uh, mm -hmm. I love getting a set feeling who they are through what they create. Let's talk about that a little bit because I, I too am completely fascinated by writers, especially songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've worked with some of the most incredible celebrities you can name, right? I don't That's get starstruck, but you put me in front of an incredible composer or an incredible lyricist, and I get tongue-tied. I don't know what to say. I, I get very starstruck. I know, and, Lin Manuel did that to you. <laughs> I, I couldn't speak. I um, you know, Stephen Sondheim. Every time I'm around Steve, I can't, I yeah. have a really hard time talking yeah, in front of him. Stephen Schwartz, who is a mutual friend of both of ours, he's yeah. Obviously, I mean, like you're very close to him. He's one of your best friends. Um, and I just adore every inch of that man. I think he's one of the greatest people on planet Earth. But uh, every once in a while, I get tongue tied even around him, who I've spoken to dozens and dozens of times. You know what? When I, it's a really interesting thing. When I plug into uh, the sort of public persona of these you know, famous people that I happen to call my friends. Yeah. I get a little weird around them. It puts, it, it can put a very strange dynamic in the mix. When uh, even with Stephen, who, who I've known for now 33, 34 years, um, Stephen Schwartz, sometimes if we're out in public and he's being his bigger public self, I get a little shy or awestruck or it's just sort of hits me like oh my god he's really famous yeah and it makes me a little awkward <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I mean I, I'm the same but even sometimes on the phone like I'm just like oh I'm talking like or even honestly sometimes when you and I are talking I'm just like oh god oh, like come on I know but you're right I know but this is what I'm talking about like I just I'm like huh you like you know, he wrote like taking the wheel, like one of my favorite songs, like ever. I just love taking the wheel, and I'm like, I forget sometimes. Why that sing that? Why we need to have you sing that song then? Oh, I'd love to sing it sometime. All right, well, I'd love to sing. You know, I, <laughs> you know me, I want to sing like all of your stuff. But anyway, um, I uh, so when it comes to writers, what is it like? Like we're both awestruck, obviously, by these incredible people. Uh, what? Uh, what is it about them that inspires you, that <sighs> creates the I can't speak uh, quality for you? Right. It is that they do what I do, but they achieve a depth and a universality and a complexity in a way that I can't imagine. Because of course they do their thing and I do my thing. Yeah. I tend to take my thing for granted because it's my thing. It's like, well, that's just what I do. And I tend to be awestruck by the intricacies and actually the differences uh, and uniqueness of other people's uh, writing. Um, and it's been kind of a lifelong uh, growth process for me to 
equally acknowledge the uniqueness and the quality of what I do and to admire uh, other people who do it, but not put them above me mm -hmm. or below me for that matter, but just we're all doing what we do and it's all different and it's all miraculous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I, Stephen, for instance, Stephen Schwartz's uh, work, I'm, I'm, I like being delighted by musical and lyric surprises, things, and, and my favorite term, and I know I didn't coin it, but uh, I wish I had, the, the, my favorite ingredient, not only in my own work, when it somehow miraculously happens, but in other people's work, is a sense of surprising inevitability, where you go, wow, I didn't see that coming. That was really cool. And it feels so right. Yeah. You know, it's a surprise, but I'm comfortable with it. And it's just a fresh, you know, uh, yeah. a fresh uh, creative uh, thing. Uh, I love, like I said, when I managed to achieve that and it, it just dazzles me when I hear other people, it's like, how the hell did they think of that? Yeah. Yeah. That and it, it, it's, like, it's interesting because it, you, the way you attack, uh, I don't even know what the word, like not attack, but approach, um, say your lyric writing, right. uh, is very different than Stevens It's very yeah. different than say someone like, an, you know, someone who's, um, people don't really know about them, but Lance Horn's lyric writing is, is mm -hmm. different than the two of you. Stephen Sondheim's different than the Lin-Manuel is different yeah. than the two of you. Um, mm -hmm. And, and though you're right, those little surprises are. Yeah. And also those, those little surprises are so idiosyncratic mm -hmm. and, and they are the, the way that they manifest is utterly different for each creator. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, that's another, I guess it's that I want to get to know who people are, whether like they're just friends or new acquaintances or uh, at a deeper level, I think, because of the commonality of what we do, other writers and those little, how those little quirky surprises happen in each person's writing really is a great insight in, or a further insight into who they are, who they, they are as creators and, and who they are as people. And I love knowing that. Yeah. I love getting, you know, an inside uh, sort of look uh, at that. Who, who recently has surprised you? Like, uh, like you've listened to something, you've just been like, oh, I'm. Oh, wow. You think of like some, someone. I was, you know what? Uh, I listened to a new Taylor Swift song. <gasps> and my, you know, album yesterday. Album, I can't think. Yeah, I can't think of the the name of it. But I'm I'm constantly surprised by her by her level of uh, craft uh, and how, of course, beautifully crafted the uh, uh, the, the performances are the the the, um, the sound uh, and the videos and stuff. But um, yeah, that, that was the last thing that I just thought, my goodness, she's good. <laughs> that, or, you know, yeah. no wonder people like her so much. She's great. Uh -huh. I mean, that surprises me. Like, I, I don't know why I never, I would never think of you sitting around listening to Taylor Swift. That's awesome. It's um, all, you know, if it's good, it's good. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Whatever. Amazing. Awesome. So uh, let's talk more about communication as far as like, uh, not just with writers, but um, when you're just, I mean, like you and I, when we talk, <laughs> we like we've said before, we could talk for hours. Um, what is it about uh, other humans that you're interested in? Like, it, You know, I think some people, when they talk to other people, say, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And I always operate from how are you from a, from a place of, of feeling? So it's, it's always, how are you feeling? How are you, what's your experience? What's your sort of visceral uh, experience of life in this moment? 
which is also, how are you? Are you okay? Can I cheer you up? Can I help in any way? Can we talk through something that might be helpful to you? Um, but it's always on a level of, uh, of feeling, which, you know, of course they, you know, people talk about how they're, how things are hitting them, you know, in their, in their thinking, but um, it's just always gauging how people, how especially dear people to me, uh, how they're, how they're feeling. And if I might offer a perspective or if I might be of help, uh, mm -hmm. Um, in making them feel better or helping them to see something. I think there's a little bit of the therapist, the psychologist. Yeah. In I, I, I think that there's a generosity in your communication. Well, thank you, dear. Yeah. I've, I've always felt that about you. Like even like the moment that like we got into the green room before the show, the first thing you asked me was how I was doing. And like you were asking me questions about me and how, I, you know, and uh, I just, I really, uh, there's always been a generosity in the way that you communicate, whether it's through music or just as a friend. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's much more interesting to ask, you know, to find out how somebody else is doing than to just me, 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 me. <laughs> All the time, exactly, yeah. It's boring to me anyway. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the generosity and the communication in your music. Because we have uh, we have a very special anniversary coming up for you. Yeah, we do. Um, it's very exciting. Actually, the anniversary year is almost coming to an end, actually. I know. I know. So it's great that you're celebrating it. I didn't, even, I didn't even know that it was happening. And I wish I could remember who told me. Um, oh, but, someone else mentioned to you that this is happening? No, so let's, actually, let's actually tell everyone what's happening. I know. Like, well, okay, so in 2000, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, I got to make uh, a, an album called Grateful, The Songs of John Bacchino. And it changed my life uh, in, in a lot of ways. I had lived in New York at the time for about seven years. You were in Los Angeles prior to that? I was in LA for a long time prior to that, yeah. And I moved to New York. Uh, because both Stephen Schwartz and Stephen Sondheim said, you should think about writing for theater. And maybe okay, you I'll stop right there. Because you were in Los Angeles. How did you meet both of these icons while living in Los well, Angeles? And, and how did I meet both of those icons when I, I couldn't get arrested? Nobody was paying any attention to anything I was <laughs> writing at all. Um, well, one led to the other. I met Stephen Schwartz because a woman that I was, uh, one of the people that I, I was accompanying uh, as a pianist was a woman named Ronnie Gilbert. And you may not recognize the name and maybe most of your uh, listeners won't. She was the woman, uh, female voice in a group called the Weavers in the 1950s with uh, Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes and Fred Hellerman. And she, I met her through a, a wonderful political singer that I've, I've worked with and continue to periodically work with for 35 years or something incredible since 36 years, my God, uh, named Holly Near, who's a brilliant writer, political activist. She really opened my mind up to the world. And through her and her collaboration with Ronnie, Ronnie Gilbert, I met Ronnie. So Ronnie was the first person other than me to ever perform one of my songs in public. Mm. And it was a song called In a Restaurant by the Sea. And she was doing a benefit in New York for a juvenile diabetes foundation. And on the same bill was a, a guy named Stephen Schwartz. And she didn't have, she didn't, they, they weren't paying her anything. So she couldn't fly me out from LA to play a few songs with her on this benefit. Right. So they asked Stephen if he would accompany Ronnie Gilbert. And he was a huge fan of hers. Uh, so he was thrilled to have the opportunity to accompany her. 
And one of the songs that she wanted to do was my song in a restaurant by the sea, which there was no sheet music for because I don't read music and most of the things, certainly at that time, nothing was on paper. So we had to learn the song from a recording of me playing it, which she gave him and he did. Uh, and he said, God, I like this guy's stuff. Do you have anything, you know, any more of his? And one of the things I've always, hopefully not annoyingly, but I've always done is handed out, you know, at the time it was cassettes and now it's CDs of my music to anybody that'll, you know, listen to it. Hi, here, this is what I do. Yeah. And so Ronnie had a cassette with like 30 songs, 25 songs on it, whatever. And she said, well, yeah, I happen to hear. She gave it to Stephen and he called me up uh, and said, I don't think there's anything I can do to help you, but I love your your stuff and I'm going to be coming out to LA uh, in a few weeks. Could could we get together? And, you know, other than Ronnie singing this one song in, in shows, again, nobody was paying any attention to my writing at all. And here's this big fancy guy about whom I knew almost nothing. I'd never seen one of his shows. I just knew he was some big fancy New York theater guy. And at that point, any interest from anybody was, you know, welcome. And I just soaked it up. So he came to New York. I mean, he came to LA, sorry. And um, we got together. We sat around. Uh, he was staying at Dean Pitchford's house. Oh. He was much more impressed at the time with the fact that Dean wasn't there, but the fact that, oh my gosh, I'm in Dean Pitchford's house because <laughs> of pop songs. And I knew about a little bit of, you know, about that world. Yeah. Then I was much more impressed than I was about, about Stephen. And we sat around all afternoon and played and did sort of round robin and played each other, you know, songs. And I thought, gosh, he's good. <laughs> he's, he's a very good songwriter, this Stephen Schwartz. And uh, evidently he thought the same. And we became instant uh, best friends. And whenever he would come to L.A., we would go out for sushi. It was the beginning of, it was like 1987. So it was like oh. the beginning of the sushi craze. Yeah. And we just became friends. And he started to try to get me interested in, in writing for theater. So whenever I would be in New York touring with Ronnie or Holly and have a chunk of time in New York, he would bring me to Dramatist Guild uh, meetings where they would often critique new musicals. and. Um, so that I would, you know, get a sense of how that world worked, which was very kind of him. And he would introduce me to everybody and the people on, he was all, you know, on the panel and the panelists were like, you know, uh, 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 I don't even, just like the, the top musical Charles Strauss and, and, uh, 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 I can't think of the names right now, but anyway, lots of big, uh, Sheldon Harnick, lots of extraordinary people. Um, and one week on the panel was uh, Steve Sondheim. And I didn't know his work either, except I'd heard Send in the Clowns and I and I, I knew who he was, but I wasn't familiar with his work. And Stephen introduced me and it was like, oh, hello, how are you? And I thought in my uh, always trying to get stuff out their way, I saw people responding to Sondheim as if he was, you know, I don't even know the Messiah or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it virtually like genuflecting in front of him. And I thought, oh, he's the big cheese that everybody <laughs> worships. I want him to hear my music. So the next time I was in New York, I brought a, a cassette tape for Sondheim. And Stephen invited me to a Dramatist Guild thing. And that particular week, just my luck, uh, Sondheim wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But I loved it for him. Uh, and then eventually he called and was very complimentary um, and uh, said, next time you're in New York, we have to get together. I want to talk to you. And I did. And, um, you know, we became friends and he became a wonderful um, supporter. And he tried to make connections for me. And the most important thing was he, like Stephen Schwartz, encouraged me to move to New York which certainly changed my life in a big way. Most importantly, because I never felt in LA part of, I know you do, but I did not in LA have 
a community of artists uh, to which to whom I felt connected and and whose work I appreciated, who appreciated my work, and you know that whole symbiosis uh, and inspiration of being surrounded by other artists, and I got that uh, almost instantly when I moved to New York. Yeah, I mean, I do have to say, the first time I moved to Los Angeles in the 90s, I didn't have that either. I didn't feel there was no community for me here. Then when I moved to New York and I built a community there, and then a bunch of us moved to Los Angeles and we found other New Yorkers. Right. So all of my, fr most of my friends, I shouldn't say all, most of my friends in Los Angeles are New Yorkers uh. who are transplants to Southern California for work reasons usually. And so I completely understand. The first time I lived here, it, like I couldn't, and I'm also a, like, I love communication. So but I couldn't find my people to yeah. communicate with. It's hard. It's yeah. lonely when you, you're here and nobody's paying attention. Well, I was very fortunate that, do you remember a group called The Tonics? Oh, I love The Tonics. Right? I had met them uh, a year before in like 90, one or 90, 91. Year before you moved it's to New York? In LA. Yeah, in LA. I knew Brian Green uh, very well. And then through him, I met Lindy and Cortez and Jean. Cortez Alexander and Lindy Robbins, who's now a huge song oh, herself. Oh my gosh. More. She's such a doll and so brilliant. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, they, they moved to New York a year before I did. And because they were so fabulous, they fell into a circle of friends that when I got to New York, they just brought me in and the circle included Liza and, you know, Daisy Prince and Hal Prince and, and Judy and, and Adam Gettle and uh, that whole Billy Porter. And, you know, all, it's just this the, Jim, in fact, Caruso and the people that became my uh, family of friends, if you will, in, uh, in New York. So it really is thanks to the tonics. Mm. Amazing. It's an extraordinary time. I, I mean, I've, I've heard incredible stories of that time of when, you know, things, yeah. Oh, right. And it's like, and, and at the time, Jason Robert Brown was the tonics 19 year old piano player. Right, that nobody really knew, but was like. Oh, no, no. And, and, and we were all like, he's very good. <laughs> Is this kid, he's very good. And then I heard his songs and I was like, what? Who? <laughs> wow, yeah. holy mackerel. So. so now let's go back to Grateful. Let's talk about how yeah. that happened. How did the album happen for you? Because people don't just say, oh, let's make an album. Like, no. how did that? And I had been dreaming all my life, actually, of uh, getting a record deal. That's what I wanted. In those days, you wanted a record deal. Uh -huh. and I, I had a small record deal in 1980, uh, and we actually released a few singles. I don't know if you know this about me. Um, uh, but it, they, you know, they didn't really go anywhere. Um, and so I was clamoring. I was just grasping to try to get a record deal. That was my big goal in life. What I had always thought was, that it would be a singer songwriter deal. Cause my fantasy and the reason I, when I started writing songs, I wanted to be Joni Mitchell or James Taylor or Stevie Wonder and, you know, do my own uh, uh, recordings and build a following and have uh, a, 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 as great a number of people as possible follow my work. And um, that did not happen. And when I got this record deal, uh, it was a guy named Billy Rosenfield, who uh, was a producer at RCA, an a and person and producer at RCA. And he, uh, over the first seven years that I was in LA, people in cabaret started singing my songs and I did my own cabaret shows. And little by little, you know, word got out and he called me up, I didn't know him. And he said, look, I really like your stuff. I, I think you're a great writer. And I have this small discretionary budget with which I can make uh, uh, an, an you know, inexpensive album. If I were to give you that budget, what would you do with it? And I thought about it. And uh, I got off the phone and I called all the famous people that I had met not only famous, famous, but also brilliant uh, people whose 
singing I, I loved, uh, some of whom were very famous, and, uh, and said, you know, there's a, I have a possibility of getting this uh, record deal. If I were to do that, would you be willing to sing one of my songs with me? And so I called Liza, I called uh, Billy Stritch, I called uh, Judy Collins, I called Art Garfunkel, who I'd gotten to be friends with, Jimmy Webb, uh, Michael Feinstein, all the people um, on the Grateful CD. And, uh, and every single one of them said, of course, we'd love to, absolutely. And nobody asked about payment uh, and they got union scale, which was not very much. But they were doing it because, which felt, of course, incredible, um, because they liked my stuff and they wanted to play. They wanted to make music together. Yeah. And so I called Billy back and said, so what if I could get Liza Minnelli and Judy Collins and Art Garfunkel and, you know, on and on and Jimmy Webb and on and on, 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 album. And on, on, on my uh, Patti LuPone uh, on my album? And he said, come in, let's have a meeting. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and we did, and that's you know miraculously how uh, how the CD got made. Amazing! And now twenty years later, you're celebrating <laughs> with an online because it's you know still pandemic, so we're trying to be safe. So you're doing an online virtual concert. Um, it's it's so exciting. So tell me how this all kind of happened. Well, this started because. Um, I, my friend Jessica Fischenfeld, who I, you know, you know Jess. I love Jess. She's amazing. I, I, she's a singer, a, right? Yeah. A classically trained uh, singer, and I met her through her now fiance Scott Joyner, who's also a wonderful uh, classically trained tenor, and now a brilliant composer and just one of my dearest, dearest friends. Now both of them, and Jess said, you know. We, we had done a song of mine called The Song of the Violins at a party. She learned it because I heard her voice and said, oh, I think you might. She said, is there anything of yours that you think I might let be, you know, sound good on? So I gave her, sent her that music and we did it at one of my birthday parties. This it, last one, wasn't it? The one that I was at? Two birthdays ago or three birthdays oh, ago, okay. two, two years ago. And it was fabulous. And so she called up back in August of this year and said, or maybe maybe it was July. She said, "Would you do? Would you just play the accompaniment?" She said, "I have a YouTube channel, and I'd love to do that song. Would you play the accompaniment? Film your hands, and then I'll film myself, and we can just put your hands along the side of the screen so that we can see your hands accompanying me, and I'll record the vocal and put it all together. I, you know, I can do video stuff, and I'll I'll edit it all together." I was like, "Sure, no problem." So I did. And it came out really well. It, you know, it was great. And she said, would you like to do a whole concert like this? And my first reaction was, no, not really. That's a lot of work. And I really would rather not do that. Uh, and then whoever this person, I would, like I said, I wish you could remember who it was, said, um, well, you know, it's the 20th anniversary of the Great Bowl of Christ. And then it sort of clicked and I thought, oh, well, I kind of have to do it and I have to do something to, to honor this recording that changed my life. Um, and it not only changed my life because of the recording, but the synchronicity uh, of the fact that I had signed a publishing deal with the Rogers and Hammerstein organization uh, shortly before that. <clears throat> and they said, we would like to do a songbook of your work. So I was about halfway through the songbook and I thought, well, wait a minute. In, in sort of an uncharacteristically savvy marketing move, I thought, well, wait a minute. We could make the album and the songbook have the same songs on them. Uh, people may notice that the songbooks, some of this, about half the songs in the songbook are not in the same key that they are on the Grateful album. And that's because We'd already written out half the songs in the key that I sing them in, because that's the key that I played them in, and that's where we put them, instead of the key that the artists uh, sang them in. Oh but the combination of those two things, having those two things out in the world where 
if people like the CD, they could purchase the songbook. Mm -hmm. So, Over, right, changed my life in a whole other way yeah. because uh, kids in college, kids in, in in music theater programs started singing the songs, which led to a whole other sideline. And I have to admit, my favorite thing to do, which is master classes, coaching students on performance of my songs. I only work on my own songs. Right. And the so the songbook, and so we did the same thing with later with the It's Only Life cast album and did another songbook that matches that. Mm -hmm. um, was there a question? I think I've gone. <laughs> it's okay. I love, I love a good tangent. I don't know where we ended up. Uh, no, no, I want to get back to the to the grateful concert. So, right. so yeah, so let's talk, let's talk about like when it is, how people can get tickets, how they can watch it. Who's well, you know, I don't want to I don't want to plug it. It's really no, no, no. I want to because I think there's of course we have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know before we plug it, yeah. let's actually watch a little clip from it because. Well, so uh, you've got, well, first of all, I want to show who's in this show because it's incredible. So let's, let's incredible. Like, look at these faces, these incredible, incredible. Leslie Odom Jr., Anne Hapton Calloway, David Campbell, Stephen Schwartz, Corey Cott, me, uh, Amanda McBroom, a wonderful Swedish sax player, Honors Paulson, and uh, then, oh, a new friend, Michael Kilgore. Oh, my God, what a voice. Uh, Scott Joyner. Uh, Alexander Sage Oyen, a wonderful writer and singer, the legendary Andrea Marcovici, Will Reynolds, the sweetest, wonderful guy in the world, Natalie Douglas, and Angel Lois Sage, one of my dearest friends, uh, and the Jessica Fischenfeld person who helped me put it all together and also sings. So, mm -hmm. yeah, quite yeah. the okay. So, I mean, we're talking like legends. Nothing. <laughs> legendary humans in you know in that group of people um the one clip that that we're going to start with here is um Anne Hampton Calloway who, wow. I know this is the song she sang on the original some of the songs 10 of the songs in this concert are from the original uh were on the original CD and some of them are sung by the original singers among who sang them 20 years ago Right among them, Anne, and the other remaining five songs are newer songs and some different uh, stuff that we end. Some newer stuff. Great. Well, I just want to take a minute to to watch this clip of Anne Hampton Calloway um, singing uh, just one of yeah. your most beautiful that's songs. By the sea. Yeah. yeah, Restaurant by the Sea, which you've talked about just a moment ago. This is Anne Hampton Calloway. Okay, so I want to talk about one lyric in this in the beginning of this song that you were talking earlier. We were talking about earlier about surprises. Yeah. Um, in a restaurant by the sea, uh, what's the next lyric? On a liquid afternoon. On a liquid afternoon. Can we talk about that line for just a second? I don't know where it came from. I'm not even sure what it means, but I like it. <laughs> oh, I mean, it could be anything. Like the first time I heard it, I thought, oh, 
they're like sitting in a restaurant or like on a porch and looking out on the ocean. That was my first visual. We, we were actually the person about whom I wrote it and I were sitting at a restaurant in Venice, California that is still oh. there called the Sidewalk Cafe. I love the Sidewalk Cafe. That's where I, that's, that was the song, yeah. Looking oh at my God. Yep. Okay, and then the other thing I thought of was that they have a martini in front of them. Um, no, actually, we're having breakfast. We oh. have coffee and, and probably eggs in front of us. But I just think of a liquid afternoon as someone who's like day drinking. Like our, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't recall that we were. No. Oh, amazing. Well, th I mean, that's one of those lyrics that, like, when I first heard it, I was like, wow. "What?" And it's the second lyric of the, of the. It's the second sentence of the of the song, and I'm just like, "Okay, what is happening here? Like, what is?" And Anne's, I mean, come on, that voice. That voice. Glorious cello of a voice. Yes. That just opens my heart up. She's so extraordinary. So beautiful. So that's just one little clip from this concert. Oh, yeah. That's happening. And so when is the concert? When is it happening? The concert premieres this coming Tuesday. Ooh, scary. Um, on December 15th at okay. 8 p.m. Eastern time. Mm -hmm. And um, and is it just that one time or can you watch no. it? People, thank you for asking. No, it premieres on uh, December 15th. And after that premiere uh, screening of it, we're going to have a live, uh, like a Zoom. It's not going to be Zoom. It's going to be, I think, what your stream, stream yard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a live stream yard uh, cast party. Basically, after party. After party with members of the cast. Stephen Schwartz is coming, and uh, uh, Anne is coming, uh, and a lot. You know, mo many, most of the cast is going to be there, and the public uh, gets a link to come uh, and and join us for that as well when they buy their ticket, um, and then the concert will be available uh, for viewing, uh, unlimited viewing, as many times as they like from then on until the end of December, until December 31st. Oh, wow, so they have two weeks so to watch it. two weeks, they can watch it as many times as they, they want. And uh, a portion of the proceeds is going to uh, a New York charity called the Alley Forney Center. Okay. And they work with homeless LGBTQ young people. So what a noble, beautiful thing they do. So we're giving a, a chunk of money to them. Um, and yeah, um, uh, tickets are available um, at my website, which is www. There it is. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> you know, dot com. Just, there's a link on the front page. You click there for tickets. And then you will be sent a link to both watch the concert and attend the little cast party afterwards. Amazing. I love it. Well, you know I'll be there, hundred percent. Thank like, you, dear. The concert—it's about an hour. It's a—it's a hefty thing. It's like an hour and twenty-two mi minutes. Oh, uh, that's perfect. That's a perfect length for a concert. That's great. Okay. Well, yeah. people won't get bored. No, I, I don't think. think so. I don't think so. It's also it's, like they have to stick around to see who's at the end of the concert. I mean, there are amazing people at the beginning, but like. It, it, no, there's no chopped liver involved. Uh, no, at not at all. I mean, every no. single person is just spectacular. Uh, so I can't I'm wait. Really, I'm really proud of this and mm -hmm. cannot thank Jessica enough for, for urging me to uh, to do it because yeah. I'm. it's just, it turned out really, really well. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait. So it's this Tuesday, Tuesday. December 15th. Premiere Tuesday, December 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, go to my website for tickets. Uh, yeah. Great. Amazing. Um, wonderful. All right. Well, uh, normally, like 15 minutes ago, we would have started the next part of the party. But we have so much to talk. Like, like please, everyone know. Like, That's now, right. Yeah. Forever. So let's keep going. Um, I want to talk about, uh, you know what, before we do that, I want to show one tiny little clip. Um, huh? From the show one more time. Uh, this is uh, one of your best friends. This is Stephen Schwartz. Oh, good. Um, singing um, one yeah. of my favorite Stephen songs. Told me when I was doing this, he said, "If you don't let me sing Love Quiz, it's the end of our friendship." <laughs> I love Love Quiz so much. And I was like, "Well, 
Okay, then, Stephen Schwartz. Again, so many little surprises in this song, not just musically, but lyrically, too. When I first heard it, I was like, what did he just say? What just happened? All of my failed relationships have provided great fodder for material. You're like Taylor Swift. I am. Very <laughs> similar. We have lots in common. Super, super in common. Yeah, sure. lots in common. Um, here is Stephen Schwartz singing a little portion of Love Quiz from the Grateful concert that's happening this week. Even if only in the version I colorized I fantasized you and me On a porch swing in front of a sunset somewhere I took a love quiz in a women's magazine You failed two out of three areas And you only passed the third When my libido threw in a grading curve Your eyes are locked, not our eyes. Your eyes locked from my eyes, not to them. I tried to like you less and less till I reached the point where you liked me more than I liked you. You jerk. I could never feel little enough for that to work. And besides, my eyes tend to give me away And you can sense the huge energy of restraint In my not touching you or slugging you And you know how hard it is to keep from loving you But your eyes are locked, not our eyes Your eyes locked from my eyes, not to them That second verse. Isn't he a great singer and interpreter? interpreter right? Yeah, his interpretation of your so material. Good. Just so simple good. and appropriate and yeah. powerful. And also, I think he looks adorable. I think he looks really good. I know. I love it. And I love his microphone. I love his microphone. Right, right? yeah. yeah. I just, I also, oh my God, that second verse. I just like, it's like, yes, yeah. Like every line that's coming out of his mouth. I'm like, yes. Been and, there, hated it. <laughs> and yet, you know, yeah. it's just, it's really, you're the communication of your yeah. lyric. You really connect. It's, it's absolute, everything is absolute, an absolute yes for me. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to my, you know, I think everyone can connect with that experience. If you've been in a relationship of yeah. any kind, it's um, you know, you, uh, you young writers uh, or, or uh, lay people, non-writers, might think that it's self-indulgent to sort of go into yourself and, and be specific about your experiences. Um, but the miraculous thing is, I think when, when one goes, does a, a deep dive into one's own feelings and experiences, that's where the most universal, it becomes universal. Exactly, exactly. And that's the basis of communication is trying to bring everyone together to yeah. understand that we're all the same. That's right. There's that universality it, it's, and that's what's so important about what you and other songwriters are doing. We're, you're uniting the world in the same feeling right. that we all have. and. Right. This song is a perfect example of that. Like anyone who's ever been in a relationship, whether it's romantic or even a friendship, we've all had fights. We've all had uh, moments where we're just like, I'm done. You know, this friendship is over. This relationship is over. And this, you know, and you can love and hate a person at the same time. Yep. Oh, you know? oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this song is just, I mean, I can't wait for people to hear the rest of it. So 
please, please get your tickets for this Tuesday or beyond. Yeah. You can watch they don't them. Yet, if they don't want to get them, you know, for Tuesday or they can't watch on Tuesday, they can watch. They have two weeks to watch. Yeah. You've got oh, plenty of time. Curl up, you know, on a Saturday night without a cup of hot cocoa and, you know. Or a martini, as you said. Sure. Or a martini if you need it, <laughs> you know, and enjoy it. Um, all right. So the next part of this show is my obsession with your one thing what okay. i'm obsessed with. <laughs> so when i first it's my left it's my left nostril right exactly yeah, when i first heard that you don't read music and that you're self-taught right uh i but then I heard your music and then I watched you play and you and I've recorded things together and we've worked on concerts together before. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, what? That makes no sense to me. So I want to just play this clip of some moments that you were, uh, that you spent at Birdland. You've, you've played quite a few times at Birdland Jazz yeah. Club, which is a legendary club yeah. in New York City where both of us have performed before. Um, I want to just play a little clip of some things that you've done there. And I want to talk about how, how this happened. How did this happen? I don't understand. I, yeah. I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable to me. So let's play this clip and then I want to talk about it. Okay. That's just crazy to me. I mean, the one-handed stuff, it, it sounded like 15 people were playing to me. Like it was just one one hand and it just, oh, so yeah. beautiful. So beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, it's, you know, uh, more of the growth process of um, I'm enough. What I do is not only enough, but what I do is is special and deserves to be shared. Uh, I didn't feel that way about my piano playing for a long time. I took it for granted. Mm -hmm. And then eventually uh, uh, enough people said, no, 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 maybe do a solo piano recording. And I did uh, two of, done two of them, which were both, there were songs from both of them in that concert. The first one is called On Richard Rogers Piano, which is just improvisations on Richard Rogers songs recorded at his grandson, Adam Gettles, uh, on, he, on Richard Rogers' actual piano. And the second one was the similar approach to Beatles songs, um, where I didn't know what I was gonna play except the title of the song, and just played them in a million different ways and then took the versions that uh, we liked the best. Um, it's, it is a magical thing, it's a, a magical trust exercise. Mm. 
Certainly to do that in a recording studio, but even more to do that in front of a paying audience and hope you don't, you know, make some horrible mistake. But then there are no uh, actually horrible mistakes. You make a mistake and it becomes part of the fabric right. that takes you in a, in a different direction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's great, it's great fun. Uh, so tell me how... How did you start? Like, how did you start? Because you've never taken music lessons, and you certainly—I mean, you well, don't. I took piano. That's I took piano lessons for about a month and a half when I was nine. A month and um, a half. Come on. No, no, no. no. I, and I've been playing since I was one, so this is about eight years into it. Um, and my parents thought that was the right thing to do, but I, I just played because my grandmother had a piano and she would babysit me because both my parents worked. And we lived next door to her, and there wasn't much to do at her dusty old South Philly row home. Yeah. Uh, but there was a big black piano, uh, upri upright piano in the corner. Okay. And it very quickly became my, my favorite toy. And I just started, you know, playing little melodies. And I think it's, you know, I do believe it's past life. I think some past life stuff carried over. Um, that's another way long conversation. I had uh, a past life. For yeah, past you're life. Metaphysical. You're yeah. I, had, well, I had a past life regression where I was uh, a composer in France in the uh, um, in 18, in the 1700s. Uh, and I told this woman all this information about this guy who I'd never heard of. And then I got off the computer. I mean, I had the date, his name, his first name, the date that he was born the date that he died. And I thought, well, I wonder if I Google him. If it, And I did. And he was a real person. I found no. him. Yes. And I called this like psychic back and said, I, and she was, could not have been more. She was like, yeah, sometimes people do. And I was like, no, 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 the actual guy, this is the guy that I was. So I believe in that stuff, as you know. That's crazy. Lucky. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Oh my God. Okay, so I, carry, I think we carry over skills from uh, former lives. From former lives. So, yeah. well, I mean that I, I can't. I, I don't know how I could. I mean, I I don't know if I believe in past lives, but I don't know how I can explain your your talent, your gift, any other way. Like because a month and a half of. I mean, I took piano lessons for years as a child. No, 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 no. But see, the piano lessons actually screwed me up. They, I didn't know what those little black dots were because I've been playing on my own. I was playing much more sophisticated stuff than those little black dots were telling me to play. Yeah. And it freaked me out so much. The reason I stopped is I threw a temper tantrum and said, I'm not going to do this. And it freaked me out so much. I didn't go near the piano for like a year. Oh my gosh. It really, I was, you know, I was, uh, you could say, I was frightened by sheet music as a, as a child. Oh my God. So, so the irony is, of course, when I got to New York and people were saying, okay, now you have to write your music out. Yeah. Like now you have to translate the thing that is closest to your heart into a language that you don't speak. And that's how people are going to interpret it, which you was know, horrifying. This is really interesting to me because I've had this conversation, you know, coming from a musical theater background, I've had this conversation with a lot of people where it really has irked me a lot of the time where I'm like, how can you be an actor in musical theater and not read music? If someone's handing you a piece of music, you have to be able to just read it and be a sight singer and know how to do that, right? And it's always kind of bothered me when people don't read music, but your explanation of how it it messes up your creative process. Well, personally, it did because it felt wooden. It felt anti-emotional somehow. But I I think you know people in your position, and you know the other irony is that I, you know, it's important to me that people singers who do my songs read them accurately so yes, it's like, right. don't do, do do as i say not as i do it's a little unfair <laughs> of me to say well yeah i don't read but you have to read every single note and, <laughs> and do it perfectly because the songs are so meticulously constructed that every rhythm is uh engineered to be the most expressive 
and the most conversational that it can be. And not only the individual lyric, but the where the lyric sits on the accompaniment, yeah. the juxtaposition of a particular chord that happens at a particular time in the melody is imperative. So, you know, if you're back phrasing or riffing or doing other things, it just kind of screws it up. Mm -hmm. It takes away from the communication of what you, you know, of what you're trying to say. I, I think it does. When you, when you mesh music and lyric together. And I don't think, and I don't think that that kind of uh, specificity in, in music necessarily it, it constrains the performer necessarily. I think that within that, A, it can actually be an aid to communicating more deeply. And within that, you can also, once you grasp it, you can let your heart out and, and, and communicate in the way that the song was meant to. A perfect example is just that clip that we just watched of Stephen Schwartz, who was, oh. I mean, meticulous in how yeah. he interpreted your music. Absolutely. But when it came to the lyric, it's it was simple, but yet you understood every single thing he was going through yep. as singing it. Yeah. Oh, that makes complete sense. I mean, you've changed, you've really changed my perception of like people who don't read music. Yeah. Like it, it, you've changed me today. Like I, well, I have to say, completely all, the, all the Beatles didn't read music. Joni Mitchell doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't read music. True. You know, True. Stevie Wonder, but you know, I mean, in a way it can be, and again, I'm not talking as a performer where you have to honor someone else's intention, but, but as a writer, you know, reading or writing or thinking of it in that kind of academic way is so much smaller than the way in which I connect to it. it feels, I mean, your, your connection to music is so, it's so visceral. It's so yeah. in your body um, that anytime I hear a recording or I, I, you know, I'm walking into Birdland and I'm hearing someone playing, I'm like, oh, that's John. Like I, I, there's a there's a, a, a distinct connection to how you interpret music and how you play it mm -hmm. that's unlike anybody else. And it's very distinctive. I know right away. I, I, I can't hear that. It's so funny. Uh, other people have said, you know, that they've heard a song of mine or heard me play or something. Oh, I knew instantly it was you. And I was like, why? I can't really. Yeah. I, you know, I don't have a sense. Uh, uh, I like it. I like that it, it, it You know what? Close. But it's probably also if you do something long enough, uh, you get, you know, you develop a, a knack for it. And also the fact that I wrote for 25 years in L.A. in a complete vacuum where nobody was either criticizing or giving me praise for any particular thing. So I just did what I wanted to do which led me to, I guess, according to friends, uh, develop my own unique style because there were, there were no limitations or I wasn't, it wasn't like I got a record deal when I was, you know, 19 and they said, oh, do more of that. We yeah. like that song, do more. Nobody ever did. So I just kept exploring and doing whatever the hell I wanted to do. Well, I'm obsessed. I'm completely obsessed with the fact that you can create that kind of material and and not really know what the black dots on the on the page not are. A clue. No, when people say, "Oh God, when you did this inversion," I'm like, "Nope, yeah, nope, nope, nope." Just nope. feeling it, just all from your heart and from your body. Yeah. That's sure. oh, I love that so much. When you when you're interpreting a song, you're not analyzing it in terms of, okay, now I'm going to raise my eyebrow at this point. <laughs> that's going to end, right? You're yeah. just, you're just feeling it. Yeah. So you're it, right. really, it's the same, the same thing. You just, again, as with the communication that we were talking about earlier, it's just operating from a place of feeling and trust rather than thinking. And honesty. Like just always, of course. Well, honesty with yourself yeah. and also getting the fear that's the trust part getting the fear of falling on your face, uh, out of the way because mm -hmm. you don't want to be too safe either. I mean, I don't want to be anyway, either in writing or performing. Uh, no, let her rip, baby. What's your, what's your favorite aspect of music? 
like your favorite like component? component. Uh, well, I don't know if this will answer your question, but chords, 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 <laughs> chords, chords. And by the way, chords. chords. <laughs> I love chords. You love chords. They make me so happy. Well, they're a great emotional tool, you know. Uh, my God. And actually, with In a Restaurant by the Sea, it's I, the only time I can think of where I sort of set myself a, a creative challenge. And it's like, okay, let's write the most boring, repetitive melody ever. And then move it along emotionally just with the chords that you put under it. Okay. That melody, yeah. it's like, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> but it's the chords underneath that elevate it and, and uh, make it do what it does. This for our viewers who don't, no musicianship and don't know what a chord is. A chord is basically when you're playing more than one note at the same time. Right. And and in in songs, it's the accompaniment. It's what it is. The melody is a single right. uh, line. It's is what a person is singing. Right. And then the chord is uh, what's accompanying them. Underneath. What's yeah. supporting them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Of course. Counterpoint is a close second. I enjoy counterpoint. So where you're saying playing with one hand, I have developed, because I like counterpoint, an independence of fingers where one finger can be playing one melody and another finger can be playing a counter melody simultaneously, which is what I was doing in my romance in that clip you, you showed. And that is great fun. It's like, how does the counterpoint all fit together and work? And Obsessed. Know. Obsessed with that. And the fact that you can hear that in your brain and then interpret that in your fingers. But it's not, but it's not, it's feeling it. It's not, and, and it's, there's, there's a book called Zen and the Art of Archery that I loved. Oh. Um, and it is, it talks about the, one of the, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to get this total, totally right, but one of the tenets of uh, Zen Buddhism is, uh, and in this book, it describes learning Zen through uh, learning a, 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 an art or a, a, a craft somehow, oh. and using that to teach one to about, about Zen. And the guy says, and this particular guy who wrote the book learns Zen through archery. And the teacher says, the point is to do it so much that you are no longer shooting the arrow, that the arrow is shooting itself through you. And mm -hmm. I've been playing now for decades and decades and decades. And I have gotten to the point, not always, but, but often where that magic happens, where I don't have to think about it. And the music plays itself through me. And that is heaven. I could cry. It's, that's it. That is, that is the one thing. You know, yeah, and it's so evident too when when it's happening for you, like live when people are watching it happen, and it's like, oh, he is in another place. Like I don't even know where he's gone, and he's just, yeah, it's a happy place. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Happy. Oh, before I know it's so late, can we talk about Patreon briefly? Quickly? Oh, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Yeah, I have one yeah. more thing I want to talk about. Oh yeah, and then we're gonna do Patreon. Oh good, okay. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. We're yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna end here. Um, we're, okay. we're gonna have one of our three hour conversations. Yeah, we're gonna on this live on on YouTube. We're just gonna have a three hour conversation. We're dead. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the last segment of my show is always um, a series of rapid fire questions. Oh no! <laughs> Everyone's afraid of these. <laughs> you, we're gonna start slow. I'm gonna I'm gonna ease you in. Okay, it's a combination of questions from James Lipton, Brene Brown, Chris Pan, who started a, an organization called myintent.org, where they help you find your one word. Oh, I don't know him, but I, I like that. Oh, yeah, look up myintent.org. I'm a big proponent, uh, proponent of them. Um, they basically help you find the one word in your life that symbolizes who your heart is, like where you are, what's your center. Um, and so there's a lot of questions that need to be asked in order to find sometimes someone, sometimes someone just knows their word and sometimes 
there need you know, they need guidance. So there are questions for that. Um, and then also some of my own personal uh, questions. So it's a okay. combination. Everybody uh, on this show gets a different uh, array of questions. Uh, no two guests get the same questions. Let her rip, my friend. Okay, we're gonna start slow. We're gonna start easy. Favorite color and why? Blue in general, turquoise more specifically. And, and you're living in Arizona right now, so that's a good color to. Yeah, mark. yeah. Um, and I don't know why. It's just, it makes me feel good to look at that color. Good. All right. Mac or PC? Oh, Mac. <laughs> okay. What's the one thing that people often get wrong about you? I think, and I've fought against this, I think maybe people think that I'm, not people who know me, but think that I'm like somehow imposing or serious or something. Oh yeah, you're uh, none of those, I mean, you're tall. Yeah, but you no, know, I think people, and maybe it's because uh, they like the work and they and they they put I don't know put me on some kind of pedal or pedestal or something. But I d really try to dispel that as quickly as possible by just being a big goofball uh, and being silly and and some of the you know some of the most respected famous people that I've encountered are also some of the goofiest people you would ever meet in your life. And so um, I think a kind of seriousness that, that, that people somehow ascribe to me is uh, hmm. not accurate. Yeah. Excellent. As you can, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> favorite meal. Ooh, favorite meal. Oh, wow. I didn't see that one coming. A uh, favorite meal. Well, I love French food. Um, I um, so like coco vin maybe, or some uh, wonderful piece of salmon, which is one of my favorite foods. Uh, would be good. Okay. Yeah. What sound or noise do you love? Oh golly. Uh, well, I mean, babies laughing. Come on, you know. Kind of <laughs> you can't. You can't help hard, but laugh. Hard to beat that, right? Yeah. So I think maybe babies. Babies laughing is pretty good. Favorite thing from childhood. Uh, my my piano, my first piano, which was another big upright. That when we moved, we moved to Palm Springs area when I was twelve, and we could not afford to bring my piano which broke my heart. So I would say my big, my first piano that was mine. And now my piano that I have uh, currently, which I've had since, I've got I've had probably had it for 30, 35 years, um, which is just my best friend. What, what, what kind of piano do you, what, what, what do you call uh, it? It's a little Yamaha. A little like Yamaha. Yamaha Baby Grand. Baby Grand, okay, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, What's that one thing that you do when you have to be brave? Um, I, good question. Go, Julie. Um, I, <laughs> um, it's Brene Brown's question. I can't take credit. Well, we've been, My favorite questions of all time. Um, I tap into a spiritual connection and I, I pull the camera back. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's very helpful to pull pull the camera back mm -hmm. and not be so pressed up against something. A little bit of an overhead. Yeah, because if, you know if we're struggling or up against something, it becomes our world. It's mm -hmm. everything because we're like ah in it, you know, sort of steeping in it. Or um, and and the other thing is we we you know we define ourselves by it. We say um, I am sad. I am anxious and how about and i prefer to again pull the can i do that too but pull the camera back and think okay feelings of sadness are passing through you know um a great image that i heard was 
to think about emotions as clouds and yourself as the sky. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh. So to be brave, I pull the camera back and think about that. Love it. Love yeah. that. Um, that's huge. That's that's going to change somebody who watches this, I'm sure. <laughs> Hope um, so. <laughs> favorite curse word? Oh, fuck, obviously. Yeah, right. Yeah. Best one ever. Yeah. Uh, favorite fruit? Favorite fruit? I love avocados, and I think they're a fruit. They are a fruit. Yep. Love yep. avocados. My top three as well. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I love that you love avocados. No one, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Have yeah. one every, every morning, as a matter of fact. Mm. It's so good for you. So good. And there's no greater disappointment in life than having one avocado left and you open it up and it's all brown and oh, I couldn't agree horrible. With you. And it's got those strings in it. And you can't, and you're oh. like, can I salvage any of them? You're like, oh, carving. <laughs> And you take a teaspoon and you're like, maybe little tiny pieces. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh, God, it's the worst feel. You need to write a song about that. A disappointing uh, avocado. Yeah. No. I've never written a song about anything that anybody has said you should write a song about that. In fact, I would be likely to write a song about not ever writing a song about anything <laughs> who I talk about. That would be more my, my speed. I love it. Okay. This one might be tough for you. This one might oh, be a hard question. Oh, yikes. Favorite musician or band and why? I know. It's a huge uh, one. And I have a favorite band and then a favorite musician. Yes. yes. Favorite band, Easy Beatles. Come on. I mean, come on. Uh, favorite musician, Joni. Oh. Joni Mitchell. Okay. She's a yeah. goddess. She's she just a goddess. And talk about being yourself, developing your own style, being, you know, a renegade and a pioneer and and forging your own your own way. Mm. Joan. Amazing. Okay. Um, describe a single snapshot of an ordinary moment in your life that brings you joy. Oh. Uh First thing I thought of was finishing making dinner and from me and my mom, I live with my almost 90 year old mom in Tucson here and looking after her um, and bringing, putting the plates, the plate on her table and offering her a healthy meal. I love that. That's yeah. sweet. It's very sweet. What's your favorite word? Oh, good Lord, Julie. What's the hard one I know? Um, <laughs> maybe kindness. Yeah. Maybe That's kind a beautiful word. Kindness. Okay, harking back to the last question. What's the best thing that you cook and why? Best thing that I cook? Um, uh, uh, I made some chicken soup the other night. We're having it tonight for leftovers. That I have to say, kicked ass. It was <laughs> maybe the best chicken soup I've ever had. Oh so, my god, that's amazing! It was so good. So that's definitely up there. And, okay. uh, it's hit my mind because it's it's recent, and I'm so excited we're going to have it again tonight. <laughs> it's really good. Isn't yeah. it funny? You just like those simple things. You're like, I can't wait. To do yeah. Okay. Two more questions. Sure. What makes you feel loved? Oh, um, somebody sharing something really vulnerable with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the intimacy of that. The intimacy of that, yeah. And, and, you know, and having the opportunity to talk through something and maybe be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's an, so an honor. Sorry. So you to me, that makes complete sense. Okay, this is the last question. I chose it because it's very apropos to what we are celebrating for you, which is what is one thing that you are deeply grateful oh, for? Oh, hello. Right? Yeah. Um, well, what we talked about that I, that I didn't get compressed by the world, 
that somehow the unique flower of my particular creativity didn't get stomped on. Mm. Uh, that I get to still have that and share that. And uh, um, yeah, I think that's, I'm, I'm very grateful for that because in a lot of people, it does get squashed and that mm -hmm. absolutely breaks my heart. Yeah. When I see even, you know, college kids, when I'm working with them and I see them trying to be like what they think is good, which is somebody oh. else. Right. Or uh, instead of just being there, the, 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 the themest that they can be, <laughs> uh, you know, which is the secret. And I, I try to encourage them uh, to do that. I love that. That's uh, that's huge. That's a huge one. That's a big one for me too. Whenever I'm teaching or giving advice of any kind, I always, it's just like, you know, how can you be your best self? Right. Nobody wants to see a replica of somebody else. Right. Or to pick out something. It's like, that was a wonderfully, you almost don't want to isolate things because then they're going to stick on that and keep doing that. But you can say, you know, I really felt like you opened up here and let me in, in into who you are instead of trying to be perfect or trying to be, you know, a, 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 a Dina Menzel or whatever. Right, right. You know? Amazing. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. Okay, so just to recap, oh. uh, this Tuesday uh, is the grateful 20th anniversary virtual concert. Premiere. It's yeah. It's the premiere. You can get tickets at johnbikino.com. Yes, you can. And uh, you can find out more information about John there as well. Um, where else can they find out more information? Let's talk about your Patreon. Well, a little Patreon bit. is something because I started archiving um, everything, every song I've ever written, which is a lot of songs. Oh and my God. Uh, that's a beautiful project. project. Yeah, it's been, I've been working on it for maybe a year and a half now. And I'm, not done. Uh, I've got around 350 songs so far. And um, it's for the Library of Congress, which is incredibly oh. flattering that they care uh, and that they want to have this stuff. And so in discovering all these songs starting in like 1969, I was like, well, nobody knows. People, you know, really my work is very much an iceberg in that people know a little tiny bit of it. And there's a whole bunch more uh, that that no one's ever heard. Uh, all those songs that I was writing for years when nobody was paying attention. And I like them. I think they're good. Yeah. I've so, actually started one of them. I'm very excited it's going to be on my album. I know. That was no comet ever scratched the sky, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I heard about Patreon uh, and thought it would be a good platform on which to share this wealth of material that I've been finding. And um, that's, you've got right, that's patreon.com slash John Bacchino. And it's a subscription thing. So it helps also financially. Uh, and you can, one can subscribe for as little as $2 a month. So it's not going to break the bank. And you get access to everything. So far, I think I've got about 75 uh, old songs and I'm doing them chronologically. So if you want to, you know, start from the beginning, you get a sense of uh, songwriting sort of progression. And I'm putting on a, that piano concert that you did a clip of. The whole concert is there. Um, there's a concert that I did with David Campbell in Australia singing my songs. Uh, there's a video of a musical, a Danish musical that I wrote, a gorgeous sort of PBS quality video of the whole show that basically nobody except a few Danish people uh, has ever seen. And it's, I'm so proud of it. I put piano solos on. I put anecdotes uh, mostly with famous people because they're really fun and I'm totally starstruck. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. And uh yeah, I hope people will uh, sub will check it out and subscribe. Thank you for bringing it up. Oh, of course, yeah. So if if you want more than what you're getting off of John's website, just right. go to patreon.com forward slash John Bikino, and right. you will get a lot more. 
Um, it's, yeah. it's amazing some of the stuff there. Too much. Um, like stop. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, and and of course, again, this Tuesday, uh, tune in for the for the concert, and you have two weeks to watch it, which is amazing. Uh, my friend, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, just hang out for me for a second. I just want to uh, wrap up the show here, but. Um, yeah. I adore you. I love you so much. And I can't okay. thank you. Right back at you, dear. <laughs> Congratulations on 20 years of grateful. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> You guys, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, next week, we're going to have a Spotlight Saturday. So just a quick show. Uh, it's the holiday season. I'm kind of, you know, letting my guests have time with uh, their families. And uh, we'll pick up again um, after uh, the holidays. But um, every Saturday, we're here at 10 a.m. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, um, if you're here on YouTube, please subscribe. Click the little bell. Once you hit subscribe, it's going to ask you to click the bell. Click the bell. It's all it's going to do is send you a little notification every once in a while that the show is coming up. It's just going to remind you that the show is happening. Um, if you're on Facebook, um, on my Facebook page, uh, go ahead and just give me a little follow. And then feel free to share the show as much as you want. Share the link. Uh, let people know that the sh these shows are happening. Um, it's the only way to get the word out is to do it, um, you know, by word of mouth. So please feel free to follow and share. Again, if you would like to support the Actors Fund and also support this show, uh, you can do that by donating to Venmo at Julie Garnier, or you can PayPal me at paypal.me forward slash Julie Garnier. And um, a very large portion of the proceeds will be going to the Actors Fund, which is my personal favorite um, charity. Uh, they've helped me personally. They've helped my family. And um, I am uh, in great support of the Actors Fund. They do God's work. So um, please uh, help us out there with that. Again, thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, I get such joy from doing this show and bringing you this content. So please join us next week for Spotlight Saturday. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.